And so we will capture, hopefully, unless there's a problem with recording, we will capture um, Tony's presentation all the way through his answers. And they're going to go on to a, a website. Um, and all the prior um, presentations are on that website. And access, the, the link to that website is in the, the uh, the invitation to the uh, to the webinar series, so everyone should have access to it. Um, if you don't, let me know. Or if there's a problem accessing it, uh, let me know. Let's see. So Tony's going to speak for roughly an hour, and then uh, 15 minutes of questions. If there's more presentations, Tony's um, um, volunteered to stay a bit longer. Um, so hopefully, we'll try to answer all the questions. The, just to remind everyone, the attendees, there's a Q&A button, and the only way the attendees can communicate with us, um, the only way the, the attendees can communicate with us is um, through the Q&A button. So as Tony speaks and a, and a question comes to mind, go ahead and populate that question into the uh, question and answer, and we will, uh, I will go through those and ask those questions of Tony and the rest of the panelists at, after the talk after the talk is is over okay so let me uh pull up a little description of tony um so okay so tony knapp has graciously um volunteered to give this talk and i i appreciate that from everyone because i know it's not something that you just wake up and give and it took some it took some time and effort for tony to put this this talk together so we really appreciate i really appreciate it so Dr. Knapp, he is the director of the Geochemical and Environmental Research Group, GERG, at Texas A&M, at Texas A&M University. Uh, hold on just a second. At Texas A&M University. My screen here is screwed up on me, sorry. Um, he's the professor of uh, oceanography, a professor of ocean engineering and the holder of the James Watley Endowed Chair for Geosciences. Prior to uh, moving to Texas A&M, he was responsible for developing the Bermuda Institute of Science. And he did that from a small biological station and he turned it into an important center for oceanographic research. And he served as its president and director for 25 years. So that's a lot of time and a lot of experience there. He's published over 250 scientific journals and book chapters on ocean chemistry and biogeochemistry, oil pollution and marine marine pollutants, ocean, uh, ocean observations, risk assessment, and climate change. Uh, he has over 18,500 citations. That's very impressive. Um, Knapp and colleagues started the Risk Prediction Initiative, a partnership between the reinsurance industry and climate scientists, as well as the International Center for Ocean and Human Health. He recently served on the National Academy of Science, Gulf of Mexico, advisory board for a three-year term and is a member of the International Advisory Board for the Institute of Oceanography of the, sorry, the Institute of Oceanology of National Academy of Science of China. He's a member of interdisciplinary faculty of toxicology, a member of the Texas One Gulf Leadership Committee for the Restore Act, a member of the advisory board for the Energy Institute at Texas A&M University, and recently has been appointed the director of the Applied Mass Spectrometry Corps at Texas A&M University. I read, always read these, these bios from somebody like Tony, and it makes me sound uh, pretty, uh, my bio is, is pretty meager compared to all the stuff that he has in his bio. And this is a short bio. I did ask Tony to uh, give us a little bit, maybe more depth of his, the background of his career as he goes through the talk. So we might learn a little bit more about Tony as we go. But with that, again, Tony, I thank you very much, and I'm going to turn things over to you. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks, everyone, for spending the time to listen to what I'm going to say. I've invited some of my colleagues to be here uh, because I don't always get it right. I certainly don't. And uh, both uh, Abby Renegard, Richard Dodge, Paul Schuler, who were part of the last trip we went back, the 32-year trip, are going to be here. They just asked me to say a few things about my career. I was fortunate to get a PhD at Southampton University in marine chemistry and oceanography. And um, I, I was on the uh, British sailing team and, and was at, I did the Newport Bermuda race. And a colleague of mine, when I got back to England to finish up my PhD, sent me an ad in Nature for a marine scientist to work on tarball research at Bermuda Biological Station. And 
strangely, I applied for it and I got it. So that started a whole career of uh, working in uh, Bermuda, which was a fantastic place to be. I, I spent as much time, uh, 32 years at Bermuda as we did on the tropic experiment for the last trip. So I have a lot of uh, very nice uh, memories of Bermuda. I, I spent a lot of time on intergovernmental oceanographic panels, and I was chair of the methods uh, of the group of experts in method standards and intercalibration. I became chair of the uh, open uh, the health of the ocean panel for the UN, as well as the co-chair with Tom Malone of the coastal ocean observing group. So spent a lot of time, and it's very interesting with these UN projects that you look at things that are written now compared to when you were involved in these panels, and you still see paragraphs of things that you wrote all those years ago, that people, people just recycle a lot of stuff. And so that was interesting. Uh, I got involved in oil spills because in Bermuda, we kept getting hit by ships. Uh, Bermuda was not on the plotting uh, charts that ships used to navigate in those days. And so they kept coming close to the island and then got stranded. And we had anything from 500 tons to a 200, uh, 130,000 ton ship stranded on the island. And uh, because we were involved in dispersant research, we were ready to disperse all of it. I could talk about that during the questions. Um, but I became the oil pollution scientific support coordinator for Bermuda. And it was pretty clear that we needed to find um, some solution for oil spills, and that led us down the uh, dispersant route. Um, and then I've been at Texas A&M for 10 years, and the Geochemical and Environmental Research Group does both ocean science for ocean observing. We have gliders, surface vehicles, high-frequency radars, as well as a very large mass spectrometry uh, center with 10 mass specs. And so it sort of fit my whole career of being in Bermuda doing ocean observing and uh, working on, on spills. We, we did quite a lot of work for, during the Gombrey program. We had three projects. One was Adamex 1 and 2, which uh, Antoinette, Antonietta Quigg ran, and that was looking at, at uh, marine snow formation from uh, oil, triggered by oil. And then we had another project that Abby was uh, Abby Renegar was very involved with, with us, which was called detox. And it was the toxicity of, of marine organisms, mig vertically migrating marine orga organisms. And so we actually went out and caught uh, marine organisms, brought them back alive, and then dosed them with oil and, and dispersants. But in order to save a lot more organisms, we actually found that we could use a commercial shrimp, and, and we put that commercial shrimp on more or less a tox level that was similar to um, the deep sea organisms. So that was sort of that. The, the, one of the more interesting projects I've ever been involved in is this project we're gonna to talk to you about. And I think one of the things I've always believed is that you know, you say, uh, microcosms or mesocosms are great, but in the end, like Odom said, you have to, you know, it goes from beakers to bays. In this case, we were able to um, sp spill oil in a, in a uh, fairly pristine environment and, and then look at it for many years. I think one of the interesting things about this, which is the same with most scientific projects, is no one really wants to fund a project for a very long time. So you'll see here, we had funds for the first two and a half years, and we didn't have any funds until we're able to convince Donna Rand to give us some money to go back for year 10. And thanks to Paul Schuler uh, at Clean Caribbean, a couple of these visits were, were interspersed throughout this. And, and uh, we ended up with a 32-year a, a record. And there are many people involved in this, but the people involved in the last trip uh, were the four of us plus uh, a few other people like Brad Bengio and, and Robin, um, anyway, uh, a couple of other people. And so uh, that was pretty good. As I say, there was a cast of many. I think one of the important things that's happened out of this is this paper 
here, which is uh, Renegar et al, with Paul, myself, and Richard Dodge. And, and Addie did a heroic thing. She went back through all the literature, all the reports. Many of the reports were in, in API reports. Uh, we, did, we made some presentations and wrote a couple of papers for the um, oil spill proceedings conference every two years but not much. And as opposed to some other projects that like Richard and I have been involved in, you know, we have published in, in read experimental journals in uh, marine biology and other top end journals. In this, it never really made it out. And when Abby sent this journal, this uh, article in, which contains a lot of information, and I would encourage you to take a screenshot of that, um, or just look up Renegar et al. It took all of the data and put it in some perspective in a, in a well thought of journal, Marine Pollution Bulletin. When Abby sent it in, they more or less, well, we were, I was concerned because it was a long article and they took it right away and with minor changes. So it, it's great that all the years of this study are now all in one spot. And uh, the piecemeal aspects of the, the measurements, et cetera, all seem to be in more of a co coordinated view. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the laboratory experiments that were done in the past and why we went to Panama. I'm gonna talk quite a lot about the logistics because they were horrific. Enable uh, us to do work in Panama, which in those days was you know, fairly, difficult part to place to do work. Uh, logistics were very important. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the past research, but overall, I think most of you that are involved in OSPO response, uh, the environmental aspects are really a trade-off. And what habitat do you most protect? The, uh, the, the beach area, the, uh, in this case, mangroves, seagrasses, or coral reefs that are all in one place, marshes, whatever. And uh, this is what one of the beauties I believe that this purposeful spill has done is allowed us to at least look and see what we think the measured scientific responses are to chemical dispersants and, and oil only. So in Bermuda in 1982 to 1984, we got somebody from Exxon Production and Research Division and British Petroleum to understand the effect of oil and oil dispersants on the major coral in Bermuda, which was Deplorius dergosa. And we didn't look at any other affiliated uh, corals or uh, other organisms. The, the, uh, the Deploria is the building block, it's the brain coral, building block of Bermuda's reefs. And we felt if they were affected by oil and oil dispersant, then the whole habitat would, would just fall apart. And so we experimented with oil at 9527 and BP 1100WD. And I think if any of you are a season, as in Tim's word, as, as I am, you remember that uh, oil spill dispersants were not really used in the United States, and people were trying to come up with formulations that would be less toxic. BP 1100 WD did, but it didn't do a good job in dispersing the oil. And our view is if you're going to use a dispersant, disperse the spill, what would happen with BP 1100 WD is it would make large droplets and then coalesce on the surface of the tank. So from then on, we just used 9527 in, in the tropics experiment. So we did it combined. We used short-term and long-term effects. This uh, figure here, we had 22 tanks, about uh, 200 liter tanks. We bring corals in from the field, dose them with up to 50 ppm, but mainly 20 ppm for 24 hours and take them back out to the field. We would do um, look at uh, behavioral effects from polyp extension, we looked at boil weight, which I'll show you in a second. We also did some in situ work. We got a permit in Bermuda to go out and 
but mainly chemically dispersed oil out in the field and followed those corals for a period of time. This is the buoyant weight technique. This was uh, pioneered to a certain extent uh, in 1984. We basically put corals in petri dishes and they had a little uh, sling on them. And we could put this Mettler bar balance and you could actually watch the corals growing. They would take up carbonate and you could measure that each day to see how well they were doing. So that was a, a pretty cool effect, I think. It's a Dodge and Al paper on the buoyant weight technique uh, published years ago, but it was very effective for us for this project. But the results were that we had sublethal short-term behavioral anomalies, sort of like here, things would go down for a short time and then sort of return for a longer period of time. There was no effect of long-term growth and uh, we would stain the corals. This is uh, uh, a uh, technique that Richard Dodge pioneered. You'd stay in the corals with alizarin and then put them back out in the field. And the growth between the stain line and the top of the coral would give you some idea of how healthy they were. And you compare them to controls. You'd stay in the controls as well. And then that led to actually the Bermuda plan to say that we would chemically disperse in 10 meters because we found out the corals would even with a 50 ppm for 24 hours, they would bounce back. And so what we decided based on the scientific evidence that if a mangrove was threatened, we would chemically disperse the spill even over a coral reef. Obviously try not to, but if that's the case, the mangroves, there are tons of corals in Bermuda, but there are very few mangroves and the ma mangroves are important. And I think that's the thing we get in with all of this uh, OSPO response, what is the most important habitat? Everyone will say it's all of them, but when they're threatened by a, a spill, you have to make some decision. And, and uh, this is what Tropics has given us, I believe. So the recommendations from Coral Oil are not surprising. Uh, first thing scientists say is more research in tropical areas is needed, right? We need more research. But we decided we, we need to use other Caribbean representative coral species because we only looked at Deploris trigosa. And again, let me just mention that I am not a coral reef expert, Richard Dodge is. So any questions on that, I'm gonna to have to ask him to, to ask if there's any detail. And as I said, it was the building uh, block of the reef system in Bermuda. Think of investig uh, investigate effects under field conditions, more representative of the actual spill and dispersant use. So, you know, that. That's more or less uh, English for let's go out and spill on a reef. Uh, evaluate over a long time frame and take an ecosystem approach. I think uh, these habitats of mangrove, seagrass, and coral are incredibly important. And focusing on those rather than a lot of the ancillary uh, programs is probably important, although we did a lot of other measurements. So we came up with tropics, and you can imagine the issues with trying to come up with a name. Um, it took days of discussions and what we would call it and how we would figure out the acronym. But the main thing was the effects of oil and dispersed oil in tropical communities, mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs. It was funded originally by APR and then API, then MSRC. Uh, the API people involved in this, people like Jerry Canaveri and uh, 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 Clayton McAuliffe, they actually came <laughs> to the uh, dosing uh, site were involved in the in the first experiments, which I think was 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 pretty useful. Um, so the application of the dispersant for reducing adverse adverse environmental effects, the trade off that's obvious. And the original experiment was 2.5 uh, years in the field, 84 to 86. And then we went back after, various people went back and I've got a timeline of that. So, you know, why Panama? Well, what, what happened in Panama is you have the Panama Canal over here and somewhere up here you have Alaska and super tankers would bring oil around into the Atlantic. They'd have to go all the way around South America. 
So a pipeline was built, the Trans-Panama Pipeline, to take oil from David to the PTP terminal in Laguna de Cherokee. But then so smaller tankers would then take this oil and, and distribute it around the East Coast. This is uh, Bocas del Toro. It's very famous. It's uh, Mouth of the Bull. And this is more or less where Columbus first landed. So it's an important place. It's a place now that is an incredible ecotourism spot. But anyway, the tankers would come here would be piped over and then you have this giant bay which I'll show you now this is the pipeline and the pipeline was expanded in 2003 there were uh, storage on the Atlantic side and then uh, there's an offshore terminal here and smaller ships would would pick up the oil but they'd have to traverse through the whole of Laguna de Chiriqui and this is the largest mangrove ecosystem uh, in, in, in the Caribbean and all of these islands, you can imagine if one of these ships in transporting oil hit a, hit, a, hit a reef and spilled oil, it would be a completely huge mess in this really beautiful uh, mangrove system. So the Panama government concerns were, this is the largest mangrove system in the Caribbean, lots of coastal traffic of tankers, small tankers, it's a place where there are just lots and lots of tribal fishermen who live, subsistence live by fishing, and they actually live in the mangroves. You can go there and see houses and huts in the mangroves themselves. And we've learned in the past, at least prior to this, that mangroves were susceptible to oil contamination. There were a number of studies done. And obviously with all the crop roots, cleanup is very, very difficult. So the question was, if there was a spill, could you use chemical dispersants as an option? And remember at that time, they were not licensed for use in the United States. So this is the scenario. So you have uh, high tide and low tide, and the tide difference is around 30 to 35 centimeters. So the oil only would come in and coat the mangrove roots all the way up to the high tide line, which is uh, there, you'll see that in the next slide. And then seagrass beds would hardly be affected, but slightly at low tide, the coral reefs would not. And so with only the uh, soluble compounds, which are um, not that many would, would affect uh, these areas here, mainly the seagrasses, but so hardly at all the, the coral reefs. And if you look at the dispersed scenario, you uh, get, get uh, very little oil on the roots of the mangroves and, and uh, high concentrations all over the seagrass and down the reef front uh, for the coral reefs. So this, this was the trade-off. These are the, this is uh, Isla Popa and the Bahia de Almirante. And these are the sites, D, O, and R. Uh, very hard to find representative sites in the study. Uh, that's another picture of it. And that's the, uh, what it looked like. The mangroves were here, the seagrass were here, the corals were here. It was a uh, 100 foot of 30 meter by 30 meter site. So 900 uh, square meters uh, or 10,000 square feet over each site. The sites were surrounded by boom. Uh, this is a half a meter boom all the way around each site. Even the, the reference site had a boom put around it just so that we could make sure everything was done similarly. And these are the sites. This chemically dispersed site was here. The crude oil site was here. And the reference site was about four miles away. We spent a lot of time, as you'll see from the timeline, trying to find the right site. Sites would be similar. It turns out they're not as similar as, as, as we had hoped they would be, but that's all we had to live with. It was, by the time we, we went and tried many, many sites, um, they were always going to be different. We could get through that by replication, maybe three dispersed sites, three crude oil sites, but we didn't have the funds uh, to, to be able to do that. So we just had to live with three specific sites. 
during the oiling, so boom went around these sites. And during the oiling, there was a very large one meter boom that went across here, just in case there was any cross contamination. But visually, we, did, we certainly didn't see any. And the current speeds here are, are uh, almost non-existent. So this is the general site layout. The mean high tide line was back here and the boom was almost up to that. And uh, coral reef seagrass beds, and you can see, here are the coral reef areas, the sea grafts, and the mangroves. Um, it's a beautiful area. And this is the cross section of a site. You can see the mangrove trees here, um, sea grasses here, and then the reef front with various corals, uh, depending on depth, but Monastria, uh, Agaricia, Parietes, a lot of Parietes in, in these areas here. As I say, I'm not a coral reef person, so if you've got coral questions, Richard will answer them. So the monitoring methods were, there were plenty of them, mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs. Uh, we spent a lot of time, as I mentioned, in pre-spill and post-treatment assessments. For the seagrasses, we looked at density growth uh, in fauna, such as uh, sea urchins. Uh, for the mangrove leaves, the leaf area, the tree density, and the growth. Coral reefs, the coverage of, uh, of other organisms as well as coral growth. For hydrocarbon measurements, we had inline fluorescence to six sites around each, each uh, well, six areas again around each site. We came back to the lab in, in Bermuda with extracted uh, samples for GC, GCMS. One of the really interesting things we did is Clayton McCulloch insisted that we take. Uh, samples of volatiles. And although this, this, uh, the volatile data appeared in the, the original API report, there's been very little said about the volatiles. And I think uh, under the um, Deepwater Horizon, we learned that volatiles are very important as far as, and dispersants remove uh, volatiles from the, the oil itself and, and they can be removed by uh, seawater flushing. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So we have a very intensive first two and a half years, a long-term 10 year uh, data point. And then there were a number of others between then and the 32 years we went back. The logistics were very important. At Cherokee Grande, we had access to lots of pilot boats, a barge, but it took hours to get to the site. And uh, that was a, a big problem because people would just get completely wiped out getting there and then you had to work the whole day and night. And, and uh, so that was a bit of a problem uh, or an issue. We even had a helicopter to take aerial survey. This is where we went to in the end. This is Bocas del Toro Las Brisas Hotel. And this was in uh, Bocas, which used to be the capital of Panama until about 1860, uh, and it uh, was moved to Panama City because of an earthquake in uh, Bocas del Toro. When we went there, there were two restaurants, one at each end of this giant street, and uh, they would serve the same thing depending on what was caught that day. And But we actually moved here in year 10 for easier access to sites. Bocas has now turned out to be a giant ecotourism spot. And this is it today. And this hotel will cost us $7 a night. Uh, that's with air conditioning and a shower, hot shower. And if you didn't want a hot shower, then it was six bucks. So the prices have gone up dramatically in Bocas del Toro. But Richard tells me that Las Brisas Hotel is still there. So this is the uh, oil delivery barge, and this is just some of the site boom. You can see here some of the tubing that we used for sampling. We had a, this is, I think this looks a bit like Clayton uh, call it, putting the, we pre-mixed the dispersant or one to 20 ratio uh, into the uh, barrels. So it was pre-mixed, which is about the only way you can do this. And then we had monitoring uh, a, a fluorometer, and we would take samples through various um, 
uh, manifolds to take samples and, and also distribute. The, the oil was actually from a different barge. So this was the site. This is when two tubes in the end, there were six tubes per site that we could sample on an hourly basis. And so we, we wanted to make sure that we, we actually tried to get a fairly heavy dose. The aim was uh, 50 parts per million for 24 hours, pre-mixed with dis dispersant. So we used a total of 4.5 barrels. So that would be about 50 or so barrels per kilometer of coastline. Um, and then the application of the oil only, obviously the concentration of oil was going to be much less because it wasn't chemically dispersed. And uh, this was to simulate 100 to 1,000 barrel spill. We used a total of six barrels, but we dosed for 48 hours just to make sure we got a, a fair amount of oil into the site. And we used speedboats going back and forth to pulse the, the oil into the mangrove system. And when we cleaned up, we used uh, uh, a lot of absorbent material to actually clean the oil and take it all away, wash, clean the booms. Booms were taken back to Cherokee ground in and cleaned off. So we, we believe we did a pretty good job in making sure that the sites would not be affected by uh, more oil. So this is the timeline. And let me just, uh, you know, so we had the site screening, exposure baseline, exposure baseline, In November, 28th to 30th, we did the dispersed oil, uh, December 1 to 3, the crude oil exposure, and then th three days, four months, seven months, 12 months, and 20 months, we went back, this blue and L paper, an API report, 1987, more or less explains all of this. In the 793, so it was a, another, we went back to make sure we could find the sites again, applied for funding and got it. This is published in Dodge et al. 1995. And then uh, various other people went back. Uh, this is Ward et al. who went back after uh, the 17 years and 18 years. And then uh, Bart Baca and uh, Paul Schuler went back after 20 years. Uh, D'Amico et al. published a paper in 2011 after the 25 years. And these are mainly mangrove studies. They're not the complete studies with a lot of chemistry like we had done originally. And then we went back, uh, a number of us went back again and, and Abby uh, produced a paper in 2017. And then as I say, her hard work in 2022 for this marine pollution bulletin. So these are the concentrations and only look here to the scale on the left, this is three ppm. This is oil only, okay, for the first 24 hours. And this is the coral area, seagrass area, and mangrove area. So we got about three ppm, two to three ppm, more or less constantly. And the chemically, chemically dispersed oil for the first 24 hours. In the coral area, we, we got around uh, 15 to 20 ppm. Uh, for the dispersed in the seagrass area where it's shallow and, and uh, concentrations uh, went up to 80, it's uh, well over 80 actually, because the fluorescence instrument would quench over 80 ppm. So we got a fairly good dose there. And the mangrove area around around 40. So we we had some control over the concentrations and we know at least what the dose was. And the dose was pretty close to what we were aiming for, which was like 50, so. These are the volatiles. And I think the, the point, so this is the mangrove area, in this column for dispersed a mangrove for oil only. And so total is 54 ppm and, and 368, so a factor of, of uh, eight times higher volatiles measured in the water column. So they're being removed from the system. In the seagrass site, 
was L, this is a factor of 15 for chemically dispersed and oil only. So the uh, volatiles stayed you know, with the oil in, in the mangrove seagrass and the coral site. This is the uh, seagrass site compared to the, uh, the, the seagrass site compared to the coral dispersed site and the seagrass site compared to the, to the coral oil only. And so this whole question of the volatiles is, is interesting. And I talked to Tim about it. And he said, well, isn't it just smothering that's what kills the mangroves? And I don't know. I, I, I think this is an area where more research could be done. And uh, as we learned in uh, the Deepwater Horizon, that was the chemical dispersant did move a lot of, of uh, material into the water column. And, it was even suggested that this was better for people who are involved in the cleanup because they wouldn't be exposed as much to volatile hydrocarbons because they were removed by the water. These are the surface sediments for the first 10 years, and you can see pretty high concentrations in the oil only site and fairly high, but not as high in the dispersed site. In the seagrass area here, uh, there were some concentrations of the dispersed oil site, which you would expect from that scenario, that, that it would bound, bound to pick up some material in, in the sediments. And uh, but it only lasted a few years at these high concentrations. But we did find that they moved around the site a lot. There was a lot of redistribution of oil and oil hydrocarbons in the oil site and the dispersed oil site. This is uh, uh, what we think happens with uh, how they penetrate deep into the sediments. It isn't just hydraulic, but there are a lot of mud shrimp burrows, and you can see them here, uh, and they, they would provide channels. This is one that's been plasticized, but it would, would show, um, uh, would, would create an opportunity for oil to go deeper. And so if we look at the sediment cores, there's zero to five in blue, six to 10, and these are the layers, uh, 11 to 20. We believe in the dispersed site, this could have been a, a bore uh, that the, the oil actually got down much deeper. But they were variable through the project, uh, generally higher in the surface cores of the oil site. And as I say, we believe that uh, the boring organisms provided uh, channels of migration. Coral reef monitoring methods, we looked at the shallow four reef, various transects. If you need more information, Dick will provide that. Uh, we had short-term alizarin staining, as I mentioned in the original coral experiment, and then uh, long-term sclerochronology. Uh, these are the replicates of transects. You can see these are all parades, and you can see the transects. And, Divers would just, well, snorkelers would just go around and, 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 and count them. And then there were four fixed 30 meter transects per site. Uh, this is the visual effects of dispersed oil following treatment. Sponges got absolutely hammered, hammered by uh, the chemically dispersed oil uh, because it would just sit and, and, and uh, they would die. But they, they, they came back. And uh, this is the dispersed oil on the, on the corals. A lot of fish here, I don't know what that's about. And so if we look at coral reef results, uh, I think I'm just gonna go to the normalized one. So this is normalized back to the baseline. And you can see in black, this is the oil only site where it more or less mimicked the, the reference site. Well, Mimicked, I guess, is a strong word. It was quite similar. But you can see the coral coverage normalized goes down um, about a, a bit. Okay, this is also a log scale. And this is one of our problems. This is the two and a half year point. We didn't go back to 10 years and they were all better, right? They were back to normal again. We don't know what this curve actually looks like. And uh, that would be something for 
a repeat visit, only not to Panama. This is how the corals get stained. They go in plastic bags for a period of time and they pick up the stain and they're skeleton. And uh, this is growth for agaricia as well as parites. Uh, there's uh, parites growth after treatment. There's really very little change in the uh, between the treatments dispersed for oil only. And then after the 10 year period, they're, they're sort of back. So there's really very little clear uh, effect by the treatments for parites. Uh, for for uh, agaricia, um, there were effects in the dispersed site for about two years, two and a half years after treatment. But as I mentioned earlier, they're back after 10 years, but we don't know what that site is. If we look at the coral reef flora and fauna, this is the reference site. So these are plants in the dark green. This is other fauna in, in uh, light blue and dark blue of the corals. And this is the reference site, the oil site, the dispersed site. So you can see what Actually, the other plots that are showed is that the corals um, decrease uh, over time. So in the oil only, there was no coral bleaching. Significant decrease in coral, percent coral cover for two years, recovery after 10 years, but no significant effects on coral growth rates. For the dispersed site, coral bleaching and severe sponge impacts immediately after exposure Significant decrease in coral cover for at least two years. Significant initial percent total animal versus organism cover, which again stabilized after two years. And significant decrease in growth rate of one out of the four coral species. So and they all recover the pre-exposure exposure levels after 10 years. That's sort of the, the point that in the seagrass and coral area, the things bounce back. And so, there were lower coral other organism category, uh, but they, they recovered to pretreatment levels after 10 years. And in the oil site, there were no effects. So that's a good, uh, you know, it's an interesting trade off. And one of the things we observed was this in, in the water in the mangroves cooled at night, and rivulets of chemically dispersed oil flowed down the reef front. It's almost like a, a zombie movie. And uh, in the oil only site was very, very high erosion compared to dispersed and reference sites. And even though the data don't indicate that because we didn't have a measure for that, it, but just visually, you would see after a long period, even after 32 years, there was very little uh, soil, uh, mangrove mud or, or anything available. And we believe this is just loss to loss of trees the mangrove roots and then the sediment disappeared. So they visually looked uh, a lot different. Some of the seagrasses could have oil, but um, some of the invertebrates such as the kinoderms or sea urchins were uh, affected in both sites. This is seagrass plant density. Um, you can see it's sort of decreased in the oil, well, actually in everything at the end of the two and a half years, but um, the, uh, I don't know why we didn't do the reference site anyway. Um, and this is the seagrass flora. Uh, again, reference oil and dispersed site, this is from Maggie's paper. Uh, so the oil site was non-significant decrease in growth rate over time for the two years following treatment. Plant density decreased significantly over time. And in the dispersed oil site, non-significant increase in growth rate over time until two years, comparable to the reference site. A plant density significantly decreased, but increased compared to pre-exposure at other sampling times. Overall, significant decrease over time. As far as the seagrass fauna, and these are uh, echinoderms, uh, so the urchin density decreased by 6 to 59% in the oil site immediately post-exposure. Recovery to pre-exposure levels 
I came back by seven months of post-exposure, uh, no significant changes in sea urchin abundance over time. Dispersed all site, urchin density went away and disappeared. Almost no live uh, animals observed. Uh, urchin density was low, seven months, but recovery to greater than pre-exposure levels after one year. And this is what we found because, and this has to do with really the scaling effect, the areas adjacent to the spill and the exposure site were fine. And so even though the exposure site got wiped out, there were plenty of other organisms to come in and take the place of, uh, of the, the organisms that were affected. And uh, you know that is something important. When we look at the Goleta spill in a second, you can see that there was a big scaling effect there, that uh, they didn't have um, uh, areas next door. Everything was, was destroyed. So the seagrass results, I've sort of more or less explained. I don't think I need any more. But the main thing is that they recovered after two years. And this is the chemically dispersed site. On the left here, you can see that mangrove roots, mangroves are in great shape. The prop roots are all here. I don't know if any of you have walked around a mangrove, but you're basically crawling over. Um, crop roots most of the time. And this is a video of the dispersed site, courtesy of Paul, video by uh, Nick. So that's that site. And if you look at the oil site um, in June 2001, August 2004, you can still see some sheen. The main thing you see is it's completely wiped out area uh, even even after 32 years. So um, oil only has a giant effect on mangroves. And this is a new, I mean, the Goleta spill in Panama showed the same thing. But uh, once you get oil into a mangrove, it's very difficult to get it out. And these are just, uh, this is sort of me taking some samples. This is the, uh, gas chromatogram or some of the samples are massively degraded. Um, we use some uh, XAD2 resin to get some large volume samples. And this is like fresh prudo, and this is an oil blob from site O after 10 years. So in the mangrove habitat, in the oil site, there's a significant decrease in canopy density, significant defoliation and obviously an open canopy. So with the leaves gone, it became more open. Uh, in, after seven months, 17% of the trees died and 46% loss after 10 years. Uh, there were, were though significant increase in seedlings after 10 years and after 29 years, more mature trees and seedlings in the dispersed and reference site. So a lot of the oil degraded and didn't create a long-term problem. I think one of the big problems that I mentioned before was the uh, degradation or the um, the sediment removal, the erosion, which doesn't give a great opportunity for uh, a lot of things to grow. And then dispersed on the side, there's no changes in canopy density, no initial, initial loss of adult trees. Two trees died after 10 years. We, we had, we had uh, tagged many of the trees in the area so you could identify them from the tags and sometimes you couldn't find tags because the trees died. I think uh, there was no significant change in seedlings. So one of the important things about these sites is that we didn't um, make them very obvious and so there weren't many people um, that had access to them. You needed someone who'd been at the site before to go see them again but uh, uh, that way the site actually stayed sort of pristine on, on a scientific basis. And as far as the mangrove fauna, the tree snails dropped by 49%. Um, and the dispersed site, they also so dropped, but they recovered it in a year. So we, we did a lot of these things. We did uh, oysters, mangrove oysters, various other oysters, looked at tissue concentrations, et cetera. So, all of that is in the supplemental pages of Abby's paper in Marine Pollution Bulletin. I suggest you go and look there. 
And uh, the short term was devastating impact um, in the short term and lingering 46% mortality after 10 years. So there truly is a trade-off be between chemically dispersed oil and oil only. This uh, spill had happened just after we did our last uh, site visit, which is a major spoil spill near the Smithsonian Marine Lab at Goleta, about uh, 60,000 to 100,000 barrels were, were supposedly spilled. Again, a very difficult because it was not a controlled spill. Uh, MMS spent, uh, uh, provided five years of money to the Smithsonian to monitor the effects. Uh, it was not controlled and it was an area of many prior spills. It, uh, it was a lot of urbanization and Panama Canal. This is the site or part of the site. And there were significant reductions of live coral cover. Acropora was affected, decrease in coral, fecundity, recruitment, and growth. But they, the uh, terminal uh, at night sprayed a lot of dispersant on the site. We don't know how much, it was uh, estimated to be about 22,000 gallons, but you won't find that in, in anything that's written down. And we think, we, uh, Richard Dodge and I think a lot of the coral issues were because the oil was dispersed. It didn't come from just uh, oil only. So the implications of the tropics project that, that Hydrocarbon spills of small size and short duration are of concern in the tropics as they are in many, well, everywhere. Uh, cleaned up with dispersants were beneficial for mangrove structure. I have to realize though that we did this as uh, pre-mixed. And so we don't know what effect spraying um, chemical dispersants would have on mangrove leaves, et cetera. But, um, so it's beneficial for man mangroves, but not necessarily for shallow corals themselves. There are scaling effects. Uh, there's Odum uh, has a interesting thing about a paper about mesocosms that uh, beakers to bays. And uh, we've seen lots of, during Gomri, lots of experiments in beakers uh, to determine what effect oil has on organisms. And uh, ours was a, a bay experiment. Uh, and I still think we need more precise uh, idea of what the short and long-term effects are. And uh, there were variable effects for dispersed and oil only by location, dose, and species. So if mangroves are threatened, pre-approval of dispersant use should be authorized in my view. These are my view. Uh, dispersant use should be pre-approved quickly, so oil needs to be dispersed while it's fresh. Um, you can't disperse an aged oil very well. And once a whole oil gets into a mangrove, there's really no way to clean it up. And the mangrove system is compromised for many years. We know for at least 32. If we go back for the 50 year, um, we'll, see, we'll see what it's like after maybe for me 40 uh, by season nature. Uh, the oil levels used corals and seagrass to bounce back. And corals took uh, two to 10 years. We don't know what that number is. And seagrass is one year. So if we could do it again, we'd use three replicate sites for treatment. Uh, a huge gap between the two and a half years and the 10. We'd probably fill that out with five and seven and a half. Uh, follow the habitat itself. We did a lot of work on various other things like uh, uh, the mangrove oysters and other things. We probably not focus as much on those as we would on uh, mangroves, corals, and seagrasses themselves. I think there's much more of the volatile hydrocarbon story and the mangrove rapid death. I think that can be done without uh, a large spill. Uh, we would use remote measurement systems, drones to for, for some of the uh, uh, aerial views, and then uh, chemical measurements, which have improved dramatically. And we need to find a venue that has as much to lose as Panama does and has a robust tropical ecosystem. So Tim, that's over to you. So this is just the summary. Uh, and you know, clearly 
there are trade-offs when you use chemically dispersed oil. And uh, these are the related publications. This uh, talk is going to be published uh, or presented on an API web page somewhere. But you can see a lot of these are in the, this is in uh, an API book. This is in uh, Oil Spill Response Corporation report. And then there's a few in the oil spill uh, literature, but uh, thanks to, to Abby, we have the whole story published in Marine Pollution Bulletin. I would encourage you to have a look. These are the uh, some of the contributors. I was so I was working on the site. I was trying to write down names, and, and these are some, but certainly not all. If any were involved, that uh, please let me have your names and and uh, we'll add them to it. We'd like to thank our funders, including API, MSRC, and Clean Com uh, Caribbean Americas. And so there's, um, I think as far as funding, uh, you know, we're very pleased that we got the funds to do this. I think it's an important project. But I'd love to hear your comments and the questions that both Abby and Dick will answer. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Tony. That that was great, um, and I really appreciate you doing it once again. I, I should have mentioned at the beginning what we're what I'm trying to do. The previous kind of webinars we've had have had been more focused on kind of individual experiences, and then Tony has all this great experience from the Tropic study. So we're trying to this presentation, and then uh, in the next few, hopefully, we're going to try to bring back these seminal studies and and make sure they don't get lost from uh, from people's um, you know, mines right now, because I think they're number one, the ability to put oil into a mangrove forest like this is, is quite challenging to do now. And so we need to take as much learnings as we can from these studies when it was, when it was allowed. So we have this tropic study today. Um, next month, I hope we haven't got everything set up yet, but we hope to um, have a similar lecture on the Baffin Island oil spill. Uh, studies. We might have two lectures because there's an onshore um, effort and then there's a nearshore effort that are kind of distinct. So we might have two lectures, um, two presentations or webinars uh, in the next in the next month, and then we'll see what we can do beyond that for other other seminal similar seminal um, studies. So while we're getting questions populated, and I see there's a couple of them. I always take the pride of asking the first few or maybe making a couple of comments. I do think. There's several things that kind of stick out to me as you gave the talk, Tony. One is that the gosh, the dispersed oil, the the sites where you just allowed the oil to go into the mangrove. I think that's probably very representative of what would happen in a spill where you let oil go into a mangrove, right? The oil just floats into the mangrove and it gets impacted by the tides and it and it starts causing immediate challenges, whether or not it's the volatiles. That are enhancing or or causing some of those impacts, I guess, is an important important question. I as I we've talked about, it, I always thought it's just the smothering of the stoma of these mangroves, and it happens immediately. I've I've had conversations with Jerry Canaveri about it before he passed away, and and that was what his his thinking was. What was the main impact? Is just as soon as you get oil into those uh, into those uh, stems of those mangroves, they're goners because you smother those and they can't breathe anymore. Um, and they're they're in trouble. Um, that was his thought. But so that's one key thing: is that any oil that come, any surface like that goes into a mangrove is going to cause immediate impacts. Um, the the dispersed oil uh, mesocosms that you had, um, that's probably a really a worst case, right? It, ideally, if you if you knew oil was going into a mangrove, you'd want to catch it and disperse it in deeper water, somewhat further away right and but but even so it looks like depending on your perspective you even if you dispersed it right within what a, a, a few tens of meters of the of the mangrove forests you 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 still can uh, maybe argue that there's important benefits um, by by applying dispersants that close to the mangrove but i think in a real spill you might try to do it past the shelf and away from the corals uh, and get a little bit deeper water um, even if you were quite close to the mangroves. I mean, Would you agree with that? Yes. In Bermuda, we had a we had a situation where we had a BP cargo of 125,000 tons of oil. 
and it was the ship was stranded on the reef, and we had made a decision that if the salvers couldn't get the ship off the reef, there was a hurricane moving up uh, towards Bermuda, and that it would be, you know, if we could get uh, a lot of planes and chemical dispersant, we would let the oil go and then disperse it in very deep water off Bermuda. And we actually, as the oil spill group, made that call. Now, of course, we were dealing with Dutch salvers, and, and they're known for their, well, you know, we'll never get this thing off. And so the, the compensation they get depends on how close disaster happens. And so they, they pulled it off about six hours before the storm hit. But uh, we were prepared to use uh, chemical dispersants because we, we were very concerned about the ecosystem, Bermuda being such a, a small island, you could coat that 125,000 tons of oil. Uh, it would be disastrous. Vicar, uh, yeah. Abby, or Paul, do you have any? I mean, it just seems that the fact that it's not necessarily the oil that's causing the impacts 32 years later, it's you lost the you lost the uh, the soil that's that's necessary for 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 those mangroves to come back. So who knows if they're going to come back? I, I do think you know we should talk about how we we get back at 40 years and and make sure that this site is exploited as much as it as as much as it as it as it can be. It's over to Abby. Yep. Is it? <laughs> I'll need some volunteers to go traipse around in the mangroves. I mean, World people are easier to come by. <laughs> I'd, I'd volunteer. It looks, it sounds like pretty. Let's go. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, it was one, one thing to remember in these mangroves that the uh, mosquitoes have landing lights. And it is an absolutely miserable place to be. So I would volunteer to be part of the coral group, not the mangrove group. <laughs> oh, you should have let the volunteers figure that out on their own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have some questions, and I'll, I'll go. I'll go through um, the questions, Tony, and answer them if you think, or pass it on to someone else uh, in the panel if you want. Okay, so from first question here is. Uh, also, if you could do it again, I think that you would not use fresh oil, but representative of sun weathering at sea prior to dispersant application. I guess that's a comment, but any any thoughts on that, Tony? Yeah, again, it's another trade-off. You know, you you're dealing with a a, a spill, but we actually thought of, about using a topped oil, and um, but actually creating a topped oil in the, in Panama you know, how, how topped is it? So, so it's, it's, it's sort of difficult. So we decided to go with the whole oil, but you know, that's a, that's an idea. We, we also, we're going to add um, a, a, a marker, you know, some, some uh, hydrocarbon markers so we could follow the oil again, but that was just too difficult with that site. But I think, you know, we've learned a lot in, in this time and certain things we would do again and others, we would we would not do. Richard, do you have any thoughts or I guess he doesn't. You can hear us, Richard. Yeah. Listen, Tony, Tony sounded his explanation was good. I, I I'd suggest Tony that your scenario in that bay. I mean, it's you know certainly it's not going to be fresh oil, but it might not be twenty four hours before it starts going into mangroves. But right, this so some of the scenarios from the shuttle tankers of oil going into the mangroves could be just a few hours. But I, I would suggest that fresh oil is probably a worst case as far as the amount of oil that would get dispersed into the water column. Right, it's if the oil was as dispersible. It's gonna as yeah, as it's gonna be, but uh, weathered oil, you might have a fraction of it that stays on the surface that could have done similar types of impacts. Uh, it yeah, might so, not have 100% dispersed, but that depends on how weathered it was and how dispersible the oil was. Oil that's weathered 6, 12, 24 hours in a beaker at least can can be, you know, 95 or more percent dispersible pretty easily. So. Yeah, and, and also I think, you know, the point you just mentioned, the where, where we were dealing and what the questions were, 
uh, you know, the oil was fresh, uh, very close to mangroves. So, so if a ship hit and had a substantial spill, it would be in the mangroves very, very quickly, you know, within, you know, half a day or so. Yeah. So I it could have matched a scenario or two. Um, all right. Next question. What do we... What do you see as the hurdles to initiating similar stu similar study today in a tropical subtropical location, specifically an in situ release and monitoring the fate and effects of weathered oils, emulsified oils, and dispersed oils on and in uh, shoreline substrates? I, I, that's a good question, and we talked about it a little bit earlier. But do you think a country like Panama would be amenable to redoing this study, or is there something special about the kind of politics and environment of of 1984 that allowed you to get a permit? Well, Noriega was in charge. He could, just um, wave, he could wave a wand and make it happen, right? It, yeah, and, and so, um, and, and these days that whole area of Panama is a giant uh, uh, area for ecotourism. So, you know, I I don't think you would be able to get it done in that in that area again. I think we'd have to go to somewhere that uh, was sort of new in its oil uh, development, was concerned about similar things, and you could argue with them that a small purposeful spill. I mean, if you think this, you know, what do we do? We 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 use ten and a half ten and a half barrels of oil total, and um, that's not a lot of oil for, I think, some of the results that we got. You know, it's, and, and we, we uh, you know, the sites were covered to a certain extent. Yeah. And I mean, I'm guessing it was a tiny fraction of a, of a percent of the entire shoreline of that area. And then 10 years, when you came back after 10 years, with that, you had trouble finding the, the locations, right? Um, because they recovered so well. So I think the impacts to a, a large environment like that are minimal, but I do think, I do think uh, finding a place like Panama that has that kind of pipeline and that, and so those, in, those issues are on people's minds and then not having, you know, tourism, the challenges that you would have now, I think that's, that may be tough to find the right place to do a place that's going to be amenable to this. And I, I believe they don't ship as much oil through that pipeline anymore. Yeah. So. Okay. Anyone else have any comments? I think going in, in the future, if we, to do it again, we want more. And Tony mentioned that site replication would be very important for the statistics to better get an understanding between sites as well as within sites. We weren't able to do that just because of the funding and the, and the logistics involved. but. Again, if we could do it again, we'd want it uh, more statistically robust. Yeah. Yeah, Abby, if you, if you write a proposal for 40 years, you should think about going to back to these sites, but then let's expand it and try to think about where else, you know, where else we could do a, a new study um, to be maybe more statistically robust or do something a little bit different, different environment things like that, but where that study is and getting the permits for that uh, is uh, the challenge. I mean, the beauty about these sites was how close the coral seagrasses and mangroves were to each other. And so, you know, that really gave you the NEVA or the, you know, environmental benefit analysis op opportunity. And so that's pretty unique. All right, next question. Were you able to identify any impacts due to major storms, hurricanes, to uh, site conditions or your data over the years? Abby, you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that question. I, I, uh, it's not something that was really looked at. And I didn't, um, in, the, in the retrospective review, I didn't uh, look and see what hurricane tracks were through the area. But that's certainly something that could be assessed. I don't think we really saw any, it, at the 32 year visit anyway, any obvious hurricane impacts. Um, that area of Panama doesn't receive many or hardly any. Yeah. Occasionally a hurricane. So. Yeah. And, and I recall that's one of the reasons we picked 
if we pick the site, is that um, it's very rare that you get a hurricane in, in Panama. What would happen to a, a mangrove forest like that if a hurricane came, you know, a strong hurricane came right through it? Would it uproot everything and destroy it? Or is hurricane or those places designed to handle that kind of event? It depends on the storm surge. Um, I, when we've had hurricanes down the Keys and stuff like that, you, you lose a lot of, you know, really all the leaves from the mangroves. But generally, generally the mangrove structure itself stays unless you have enough, you know, water flow to really remove a lot of sediments and, and remove trees and that sort of thing. Just, just based on what I've seen in the Keys, uh, mileage may vary, obviously, depending on the storm. But this, that location for tropics was kind of a protected bay, right? This, mm -hmm. so it was it, very protected, yeah. Yeah. OK, next question. Do we have long-term follow-ups on other mangrove impacted by oil that is uh, Islet in Tampa Bay 20 to 25 years ago. Any comments on that? 20. I don't I don't know about uh, the Tampa Bay. I'm not sure. I don't think there have been any follow-up studies with uh, with Galita either. I know they lost a lot of mangroves, but I don't believe so. For uh, MSR the no, it's not MSRC, for the uh, Domri program, I was sort of interested in going back to all mangrove sites around the world and see what they're like, but um, that wasn't something that was thought to be important. Yeah, there's another objective to put into your proposal, Abby. We go the, the spill in Tampa Bay, I guess it was in the mid 90s or so, and then the Goleta site. Let's find some of those locations that, you know, we don't have all the history of sampling between, but let's see you know, 20, 25, 30, some years later, what's the, if there's still observable impacts from from much um, larger oil spills than happened to tropics, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data from the Goleta site. We were involved and Dick was on the advisory board and, and yeah. well, the Smithsonian did a great job in recording everything. And the, and the Goleta site did have oil that went right into the mangroves. Is that? Yes. Or, Okay. Well, one of the fascinating things about, about sites that are obvious like that, I mean, where we were, you know, we didn't make it obvious that that was an area we were studying. But in the uh, Goleta site, there were boats that uh, would clean their bilges out because they knew there was a lot of oil. And so they would go past the site and <laughs> put some more oil there. As far as I remember, there were a number of... of uh, uh, Kathy Burns found a number of other oils that were uh, spread out in the area afterwards. <laughs> well, okay, that uh, compli complicates things a little bit. Was that site you mentioned that the at the Goleta site that they do some nighttime spraying? Were were they going? You think they were going into the mangroves or spraying over the top of the mangroves, or was it oil that was on the ver edge of the mangroves? Or do you have any idea? So we have no idea. I, I mean, and, spraying oil. I think, I think they were focusing on the reef area okay. because that was the most obvious. Yeah, spraying oil. I don't oil think it was restricted to nighttime. I think they did in the day. Do yeah. Spraying oil oh. in the mangroves with dispersant is, I think, uh, a very bad idea because uh, now you got the problems from just the physical impacts on the mangroves. And then you now you're putting oil into the water column there too to increase the impacts, I would. I would imagine. All right, another question. Regarding trade-offs, Tony made a very important point about the scale of the oil exposure with recruitment being rapid from adjacent sites for this experiment, but not with larger experiments of oiling at real spill sites, which is, I, I, I caught that as well. Any other thoughts on that, Tony? Or, or no, it's just, you know, that's, that's factual. <laughs> yeah. You know, they just have to go, once the uh, uh, toxicity of the, oil has been decreased, they can just go back in and, and recruit uh, in those areas. So, yeah, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. Yeah, that's an important thing to remember when you're when you're trying to make broad based conclusions from a small site like this, even right, if it was a 10 mile, 10 mile wide strip, right, the edges might be recruited pretty quickly, but the middle of that strip is 
is a long way from the edges, right? And so uh, recruitment into those locations may be somewhat slower. Maybe not with the corals. What do you think, Dick? Well, yeah, I, it just depends on the species. Some corals are you know, broadly based uh, recruitment in summer it would be edge effects, you're right. And then that also brings up the fact that you ought to have multiple sites to, to look at that because it's only like at one site, you're stuck with what happened there. But if you look multiple, then you can get a better average and generalize picture. And and the last comment here, and we can wrap it up here. But I think uh, Abby, we're getting getting the opportunity to kind of travel um, all over the place. Add add Ixtoc Campeche Bay mangroves into the into the proposal proposal as well, and so we can make kind of a big tour of uh, North and South America. Uh, mangrove forests <laughs> 40 year study, in the 40 year study. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's really a you know a significant question that still remains is is the question of chronic effects. Because nothing we do in the lab really really reaches past, you know, more than several months and understanding chronic impacts, particularly from long-term sediment contamination, it is just a just an unanswered question. It's very difficult to quantify. Um, so maybe also targeting sites where there is some level of chronic contamination from some source uh, is would be a really good follow-up, especially if that chronic contamination can be quantified in some way. Yeah, I think, you know, the in the U.S., we have pre-approval zones, but those are not near shore areas, right? Three miles from shore and greater than 10 meters of water where, you know, Hopefully, the pre-approval rules might might allow a very rapid decision to be made about whether or not dispersants um, can be used because you, you know time is not your is not your friend after an after an oil spill. But as far as I can see, damage to mangroves is probably going to be the longest term impact of any kind of ecosystem, right? The, these mangrove forests, because it's not just the impact from the oil; it's impact from the loss of the mangroves and the loss of the stability of the of the soil underneath those mangroves and that's where the maybe the long-term impact so if we believe that that's an important thing to to protect because of that then then a then another study that looks at areas where we can see if that's the case where we can see you know from the spills that happened 40 50 what is uh ick stock is almost 50 years ago yeah uh, then uh then that can provide evidence for where you know we can start advocating for there should be some rapid decision making for spills in those in, in those environments um, to make sure that that uh, that that ecosystem is protected as much as as much as possible. So I, I think that actually it can be a pretty important study um, and target that kind of thing and let's see let's see what these long term impacts um, from these spills have been um, and see whether or not it does make sense to uh, be more aggressive, I guess, in, in advocating for dispersants in those locations. There's nothing else you can do, right? You're not gonna get in there with booms and skimmers, especially in these remote locations when you have just no time at all. And I'm not sure a boom would even protect some of these in environment for very long if you could put it in, in place, so. Okay, all right. Well, it looks like we're coming to the end of our questions and we're actually coming pretty close to the end of the time that we normally we normally use. So once again, I and I appreciate Tony, you taking the time uh, to pull this together. I think you had a cheat sheet though with Abby's with Abby's paper, which is probably a little bit helpful. I'm, I did. I'm assuming, but I, I know it takes time to do this. And then once again, I appreciate you doing that. And and Dick and Abby and and Paul, uh, if there's any last thoughts that anybody has, I I'll, I'll open it up here. But I appreciate you guys taking the time um, to attend as well. And I. Literally, I think we should, and I, I'm, I'm looking at some of the people that had some of the comments on, on here. I think we need to include those if we do any brainstorming for how to uh, do, uh, you know, a tropics part two or three or whatever we call it, we call it now, and on what we could, what we could do to, and to enhance um, study of this issue. Any final words, anyone? Uh, I will. Uh, if anybody has some additional thoughts to discuss, I'll be giving a, uh, another short talk on tropics uh, at ITAC in October in Halifax. Um, and we'll be there all week if anyone wants to chat further about, about this project. And I guess Tim uh, has wrote me into giving a, a talk at Clean Caribbean. Is it? 
playing mm -hmm. playing golf in New Orleans. Golf. Yeah, playing golf in New Orleans in November. Yeah, so yeah. there's a couple of opportunities to to uh, meet in person, which is fantastic, and and have have discussions during and after the talks, and the, and then during the week as well. So that's that's great. Okay, well, thanks everybody, and thanks for all the participants. Again, we're going to try to have a presentation in where are we August so in September we hope that we're going to have a presentation on the Baffin Island oil spill study which is similar kind of study to this except it wasn't a mango uh, ecosystem it's, it's more of a beach ecosystem in the in the north um, so stay tuned for the invite um, to that and uh, and we'll see you next time thank you Dan. Right, thank, thank you, you.